Yeah. <laughs> so today we have a lot to cover. And I don't think that we're in the review section so much anymore once we finish talking about 5.4. Because if you were taking Cal 1, you wouldn't have gone any further than 5.4. Now you should have gotten to 5.4, but I know that there's some instructors that don't get time to cover everything or whatever happens, happens. But some of you have seen the stuff from 5.4 before and then some of you haven't, okay? So we did start a couple of examples in the last class. I know it was a whole week ago, but we did start some. Um, and so what I wanted to do is continue today with a couple more. And then um, eventually get to 5.1 and then eventually, hopefully, 5.6. Now, as you guys know, I've said it a couple of times, right? I don't ever try to rush to get through something. I just go through it and however long it takes is how long it takes, right? Um, if I have to shift deadlines or push things back, that's not a problem, okay? Um, it might get a little confusing as a student if I'm pushing things around, sliding stuff everywhere. But I mean, I can only go as fast as you guys let me, okay? I'm not going to try to just speed through everything just because, okay, to keep up with the, the timeline. The goal is for you guys to understand, right? Um, okay, so with this example, um, does anybody recommend like what I should do first? Because I do have to integrate it first, and then I do have to evaluate it at these bounds. But how would I go about trying to end this? Anybody have an idea of what to do to start with? Uh, first of all, the t, the square root over t, so five times square root over t times or minus five times t square root of t. Mm -hmm. So you distributed? There we go, distributed. Mm -hmm. So then you got five square root of t minus t square root of t. That's one way to go. Mm -hmm. And then what would you do from here? Because we do have two separate terms now, right? Which we should be able to integrate. However, we only have like pretty much the power rule, right? For right now in this problem. So you can also get rid of the square root. Mm -hmm, and change them into powers. So this would be 5t to the what power? Negative. Not negative. It's not at the half. bottom of a fraction, is it? So, uh, t to the half. T to the half. Mm -hmm. Only when the square root's at the bottom does it become negative. Anything, regardless if it's a square root of t downstairs or t squared downstairs. And when you want to move it up, that's when it turns negative. But since mine wasn't at the bottom, I don't need to use negative. However, I do need to write this expression as just one exponent. So any guesses or explanations on how to get that exponent? Is it three halves? It is three halves. How did you get that? Um, I added, um, so the T to the power of one, and I added the half to it. Mm hmm So when you have two expressions like this, right, you add their exponents. So you had T to the one and T to the half. So yeah, if you want to write them as one expression, you just add those exponents. You're right. And you get three halves. <clears throat> Excuse me. So good. Um, now, now we can integrate. Now you can do two steps. Like you could separate each one, right? And then have two terms to do. And then rewrite it again where you factor the five out. But none of that is necessary. You don't have to write all of those steps. We can understand that that's what's happening behind the scenes. But we don't have to keep rewriting the intervals every single time, okay? What I could do is just write five and then actually integrate t to the one half, then minus, and then actually integrate t to the three halves. And I won't have plus c because I do have bounce, right? So all I have to do is remember to evaluate both of these expressions 
um, from zero to five. So what do we get when we integrate T to the one half? Two over three T to the three halves. Let's say it again. Two thirds T to the three halves. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. Because this rule says we're going to add one to the exponent, right? And then divide by the new exponent. And if you're dividing by a fraction, that's the same as multiplying by the reciprocal, right? So we do get t to the 3 halves since 1 half plus 1 is 3 halves. And then we would divide by 3 halves, but that's the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. And then he went one step further in his head and already put the coefficient in the front, but it's okay. I put it like that for now. Okay. Now for the other one though, what do you get when you add one to this exponent? Five halves. Five halves. Mm -hmm. five halves. And then I would divide by five halves, which is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal of five halves. Mm -hmm. Right, this one doesn't have a five, but that one does. But I do need to multiply those. So I'm gonna have 10 over three, t to the three halves minus two fifths t to the five halves. And then again, I still need to evaluate that whole thing from zero to five. So these are the steps for the integration. And these are the steps. It's okay if you go from here to here. Like that can be done in your head. Um, and even this part could probably be done in your head. But I would say for sure, you're going to want to show the distribution and you're going to want to show converting everything to powers. And then you have to show what you get after you integrate. And then you actually have to evaluate it yourself. So for me to evaluate, it would be five to the three halves minus two fifths, five to the five halves. That's what we get when we plug in five. But when we plug in zero, what are we gonna end up with? Yeah, zero to any power is zero, right? And then again, zero to any power is zero. So you're just subtracting a big zero, okay? You also need to show this step of integration, or I'm sorry, evaluation. Then from there, you are totally allowed to use your calculator. I mean, I would too, so <laughs> I'm gonna grab it real quick and I'm gonna have 10 over three parentheses five raised to the fraction three over two. And it gives me this decimal number, but I don't wanna round yet. So I'm just gonna leave that in my calculator and I'm gonna hit minus two over five parentheses, close, oops, that's not a parentheses, raised to the fraction five over two. And then it tells me it's one, 14.91, because usually they have you around, right? Now, this is great if they ask you for a rounded answer. However, I noticed that WebAssign and even on the tests, um, it just depends on the problem. Sometimes the problem says give you a rounded answer, and then sometimes the problem to ask you to give them an exact answer, okay? Now, the rounded one is the easiest one because you're just sticking it in your calculator, right? But when they ask you for an exact answer, that's a little bit harder, okay? When I type this in my calculator, it just automatically put it into a, um, what is it called? A decimal, okay? But this is actually a radical expression, and so is this one, okay? So if I were to ask for an exact answer, we do have to simplify that better, okay? So then this would be 10 over 3, and you basically have 5 with the square root, but a three on the inside. Then this would be two fifths and then five 
with five and still a square root. Now it's a square root because my denominators are two, okay? But the exponents are what tell me the exponents on the inside. I'm using this rule. So it's just one of those rational exponent conversions, okay? Then I know that if I'm taking the square root of something to the third power, I need two of these for a single five to come out, but then that would leave me with one five left over. And the same thing here, I would need a pair, right? Because it's a square root, a pair for just one five to come out, but then I'd have another pair, so another five can come out, and then I'd have one five left over on the inside. Again, these are all of our radical expression rules. So this would give me 50 over three square root of five. That would cancel one of them, but then I'd have 10 square root of five. And then you could factor out the square root of five. You don't have to write this step, but this is what's happening in the brain. You just figure out this so that you can combine those terms, right? So 50 over three minus 10 is 20 over three. So there's actually 20 over three square root of fives. And let's verify. If I were to have typed 20 over three times the square root of five, is that the same thing as that 14 number? And it is, okay? But this is the exact answer versus this one being the rounded answer, okay? So I wanted you to have an example of how to work out that exact answer in case you don't remember all of those radical rules and exponent rules and all that good stuff, right? All that's algebra and like intermediate algebra, like if you do in high school before you even get to algebra in college, okay? But it takes a lot to bring it all back, okay? Yeah, I might have seen it in the past, but <laughs> haven't used it, right? And so if you don't use it, math is very much like that. It's not like riding a bicycle, like you learn, and then forever you remember, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> math is you use it or lose it, okay? So if you're not using that math often and continually taking classes, um, it goes out the window, okay? Even for me, like if I don't teach Cal 2 for a long time, for like a few years, and then they give me a Cal 2, I have to go review everything because you forget it after a while, okay? Um, so it's not just you. Don't ever freak out and be like, oh my God, I just don't know this. It's not you. It's just the way math is. Okay. But that's why I give you all these different kinds of problems. So we can try to like bring it back a little bit. Okay. Um, does anybody have any questions about this one? Why don't you do that five out in the second part, the 10 over three? From here to here? Because we have a rule that says you have um, the fifth root or a squared like that is just a, right? Isn't the square root of something squared just that value? Okay. So when I have five cubed, it's like saying five squared times five, isn't it? And then I can separate it according to my square root properties. And then what's the square root of five squared? Just the five, right? and then you still have that square root of five left. So this is what we were doing when we did this one. For me, I just know that this is a two index. So I need two of these for one to come out. And then if I took two of them for one of them to come out, I'm only gonna be left with one more, right? And here, if I need two of them for one to come out, if I take two from here, one will come out, but I'll still have three left. Then I can take another two and one will come out, but then I still have one left on the inside. Okay. okay. But thank you for asking because you need to be able to see it all, right? You don't want to just gloss over something, okay? Are there any other questions? Okay. So we'll go to our next example. I think I have two on this one. Now these are from the end of 5.4, so they're not, oh yeah, they do ask me to find the area. I thought they weren't asking me to compute them, but they are. But this is kind of like 5.3 together with 
Because in 5.3, they gave you the pictures, right? And asked you to set it up. And then now here, this one's just giving you the equations and asking you to set it up. The only thing extra in this section is that after I set it up, I can actually figure it out, okay? So for this one, we know that our area equals the bounds from A to B of whatever our function is, um, dx. And I'm using x because apparently that's the variable here, okay? And y, we know that y is just a little fancy way of saying f of x, isn't it? So we are given our function and we are given um, our bounds, actually. What are the bounds? Uh, zero and pi over, over three. Because mm -hmm, the region goes from here to here, right? From this x to that x. And this is dx, so that's what the bounds go. The bounds should be x's, okay? So you're right, from 0 to pi over 3. And our function is sine x. And that's not a straight line. I tried to draw it curvy, but it didn't come out as curvy as I'd hoped. <laughs> it's not straight, okay? <laughs> and then I'll put my dx there. Now, this one, you might need the rules if you don't remember them, okay? But what is the integral of sine? Negative cosine of cosine. Mm -hmm. Because a derivative of cosine is negative sine, right? And so then that negative will make it positive, good? And then I just have to remember to evaluate it from 0 to pi over 3. Now, be careful with the trig functions. If you're really great at knowing um the trig values of certain angles then okay great but don't ever assume that because there's a zero here when you plug it in it's automatically going to be a zero when it comes to trig functions when it's powers of x or powers of t yeah they will turn to zero right but not necessarily all trig functions so definitely do cosine of pi over three minus a negative cosine of zero so this minus is from the fact that I have to plug in one and then subtract what I get when I plug in the other bound, right? But these minuses are because what I'm plugging it into has a minus, okay? And then let's see, I'm gonna be lazy. So pi over three, because I'm typing in pies, you want to make sure that your calculator is in radian mode, okay? If it's not, just click mode, and it might be in degree mode. Just highlight radian and hit enter, and then second, quit. But that does have to be in radian mode. If you're typing in radians and it's not in radian mode, it'll give you the wrong answer. And the same thing goes for degrees. If you're typing in the cosine of 50 degrees, your calculator has to be in that degree mode in order to pop out the right answer. Okay. Normally we deal in radians, but every now and then they might throw a loop, <laughs> a curveball at you and give you degrees. And then you have to remember to convert your calculator mode. Okay. So let's see what we get. We get one half. So this is actually negative one half. Negative and a negative will be plus. And then if you remember it, great. If you don't, I'm typing in the calculator. I get one. So then negative one half plus one is positive one half. So it wasn't too bad. They're just kind of warming us up. They didn't give us any crazy function to um, integrate. It's not the point here. The point is just to learn how to set it up and then go from there. We will get crazier, right? And we know that in 5.5, .5 it does get weird a little. It keeps getting weird. All of chapter eight is even weirder and weirder and weirder and weirder as we keep going. <laughs> they look crazy. But you get a sense of accomplishment because then you look at what you're integrating, you're like, wow, I've come a long way <laughs> from what we started with, just integrating sign. Okay, so the next one is the same thing. However, this time I don't have that picture. So we don't really know like how far we're going, right? What is it that is shaded between the x-axis and this, this function here, okay? So we definitely have to graph it. 
and I don't know how much y'all remember about graphing quadratics, but I know for me, if I want to draw it, the first thing I need to know is where that vertex is of the parabola, right? The high peak or the low uh, valley. I have to know where that little hump is at so I could draw it accurately. I also need to know where the x-intercepts are at in order for me to draw this successfully, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to find the vertex, and that's usually where x equals negative b over 2a. And in this case, my b is actually positive 8, and my a is actually a negative 1. So when I simplify that, that gives me the x value of 4 in the end. And then if I want to know the y value, I just plug in that 4. So let me see, negative 16 plus 32. So my vertex is going to be at the point 4 and 16. So that gives me an idea of how high I got to go. Now, I know that that's the, uh, a peak versus a valley only because of this first number A. If A is positive, then it'll be a parabola looking like this upward. But if your A is negative, then it's actually a parabola going downward, okay? And since I know that my A is negative, I know it's going downward, which means this guy is a peak. It's like a maximum, okay? So that's a negative two? Mm, this is just two and then times a negative one. And the negative one is where the X is? Say it again. Like where you get the negative one? The coefficient of x squared is a negative one. A is whatever the coefficient of x squared is. B is the coefficient of x. And then if I had a constant, that would be c, right? All quadratics are of this form. Good, good, good. Yes, keep asking those questions. I can only assume that everybody remembers everything, but I know for a fact that that's not true. So when you see something then you're like, what, where'd that go? Where'd that come from? Please ask, okay? This is good. <laughs> you got it. Negative B over Mm, you did the derivative? Yeah, I got it. took the derivative of negative x squared. Mm -hmm. Say that would equal to zero. Well, that would give you the slope formula, but that's not a slope at a specific x value, though. But we don't even have a specific x value. Oh, I know why. We will get there. But no, you take one, right? So when you are finding maximums and minimums, right? Isn't that the strategy? Yeah. You take the derivative and then you set it equal to zero and then that X value gives you a max or a min. Now you won't know whether it's a max or a min unless you do another test, right? But you could get it that way. Mm -hmm. You have to do the uh, prime two. Mm -hmm. prime. The derivative and then see if it's positive or negative because of the concavity. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Mm-hmm. Now, my x-intercepts, how do you find x-intercepts? You set y equal to 0. Not x equal to 0. If you set x equal to 0, you're finding the y-intercept. Mm -hmm. But if I set y equal to 0, then I have this equation. I got to solve this one, right? And Ben, that's not wrong. If you were to do that on a test to try to graph and you found the vertex that way, that's totally okay. So how do I solve this? I mean, I guess like two ways. One is to use the quadratic formula, but since we don't have a constant, we would just plug in C as zero. But the faster way would be to just factor this, right? What could I factor from those guys? Mm -hmm. And so I'd still have a negative X plus eight. 
And then if I set each one of these factors equal to zero, I have one X value of my X intercept, but then if I solve the other one, I'll get the second X value for my intercept. <clears throat> One, two, three, four. I'm going to say that's 16. So these are going by fours. Only because I know I need to get as high as 16, right? This thing right here. So one, two, three, this one's four. So four and 16 is about right there. And then my first x-intercept is when x equals zero. And my second x-intercept is when x equals eight. So now you kind of know where the parabola is going to go, right? So then now that I can physically see it, I see my shaded area between the graph and the x-axis is right here. So how would you set up your integral? So it's definitely super nice when they give us a graph, right? <laughs> but when they don't, we do have to come up with it. And we are gonna keep practicing graphing by hand. One, because you're not allowed to have a graphing calculator, right? You're only allowed this little thing. And then two, because when we get to chapter seven, you're going to want to graph things when we get to chapter seven. Because not only do you have to look at that, then you have to think about rotating this around this way or rotating it around that way. And it gets really mind boggling. So it's definitely beneficial to know how to graph this stuff. So eight and roll. Mm -hmm. Eight is the top number zero is the bottom number. Your bounds got to go from lowest bound to highest bound. So what's the lowest x value bound? Zero. 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 And then the highest x value bound? Eight. 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 Amma, were you just giving me the answers or did you have a question? Yes, I was. No, I, I okay. was giving the answers. Okay, okay, awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, mm -hmm. Parentheses negative x squared plus eight x plus parentheses dx. Yep, you got it. And thank you for using the parentheses. We need them, right? Because we're integrating two terms. Over here, we didn't need the parentheses because we were just integrating one expression, one term. Okay, but this time we're doing two terms, so you definitely need those parentheses. Good. So now again, I'm gonna rewrite this doing all the integrals. I'm just gonna integrate it, okay? It's already ready for integration. So I'm gonna have negative x to the what power? Third, and then divide by the new power. Then eight times x to the what power? Second, divided by that second power. And then I still have to evaluate it from zero to eight. Now I'm actually gonna reduce those to a four, but I don't wanna rewrite it. So I'm just gonna leave that. <laughs> but if you wanted to rewrite it, you could. I'm just running out of space. So I don't wanna rewrite if I don't have to. So changing up colors definitely helps. I haven't seen, I mean, I've seen you guys in the face-to-face -face class, but I have not seen any of the people from online um, in remote, any of your handwriting. Um, and I always tell people, if you have a hard time reading your own handwriting, try to write it better <laughs> because then I got to read it and I got to grade it. And if I can't read it, I can't grade it, right? <laughs> so make sure you make it as legible as you possibly can. And I have it too. This is not how I normally write, by the way. I normally write like chicken scratch, but being I'm a teacher, I have to make sure it's legible for you guys, right? And so I'm doing my best to try to make it look neat. But this is not my default. My default is just like super fast. Okay, so let's plug in these numbers. We're gonna get um, negative eight cubed, whatever that is. And then I'm gonna put the four times eight squared. And then what are you gonna get when you plug in that zero? 
for both of them, right? So we're just gonna put one big zero. Because if this is zero and then I'm adding another zero, it's just gonna be one giant zero. So let's see, this I can put in my calculator. So I've shown you the setup. I've shown you what I got after I integrated and I showed you what I got when I evaluated it. Now I'm just simplifying this evaluation stuff. And the reason why I'm verbally saying these things is because those are the three steps that you have to show when you're taking a test, okay? So every time I give you a problem like this, I'm gonna ask you for the setup, what you got after integrating, and then what you got after evaluating, and then to simplify your answer, okay? The simplifying your answer part is the only part that you should be putting in your calculator. I know your calculator, well, if you have the black one, does anybody have it yet? The black one recommended you guys get? You have it? Can I borrow it? Because it does have something on there. I would only recommend that you use it to check your answer. Yes. Don't do use it to get the answer. Because then you're missing all the final parts of it. Thank you. But it is good to know how to check the answer. The thing is, is that you can only type in definite integrals in this calculator. You can never type in an indefinite. So if there's no bounds, you have to know how to integrate it. Okay. There's no even no way around it. But if it does have bounds, you can put this in the calculator. So if I click second and this button, I could put in zero, go to the top, plug in eight, go to the right, plug in negative x squared eight x and hit enter 256 over three. It's the same answer, right? And even if I had given this, all I would have had to do is hit the double arrow and it would give me, it's supposed to give me the answer. Let's go back. Clear. I'm gonna copy this and then I'm gonna hit the double arrow so that it converted to a fraction maybe. Yeah, it does. Okay. So you can use it to check, but like I said, on the test, you're asked for not just the setup, but the integration step. What did you get after you integrated it? What does it look like when you plug in your numbers and then simplify the expression, okay? And if all you're doing is giving me the setup and the final answer, you're only getting half the credit, right? Because you missed two of those steps. So make sure that you're doing that. Here you go, I won't use this. And it's worth mentioning because I can't tell you how many people got really, really mad at me because <laughs> they're like, I selected the right answer. I should get the full credit. And I said, yeah, but you didn't demonstrate to me that you knew how to integrate that expression and that you knew what was going on when it came to evaluating it. I have to see those steps in order to know that you know those, those bits, okay? Because not only am I testing you, like this problem, yes, it's testing you on setup. And yes, I'm testing you, you know, to see if you know all this. But if I wanted, I could put in an expression that I'm trying to make sure that you know how to integrate. And then the next problem, a different kind of expression to make sure you know how to integrate that. And the next problem, a different expression, right? So that I can know that you know A, B, C, and D, okay? But I do try to double whammy a lot of my problems. <laughs> so like if I'm testing you on this topic, I wanna try to like stick as many other topics as I can in there so that you don't have gobs and gobs of problems. Okay, good, good, good. So we're finally getting into 5.5. .5. Now 5.5 .5 was substitution, right? So this one was a little weird because you had like inside functions and outside functions and all this good stuff. Um, and it was really a little complicating. And somebody I think asked me, I don't know if it was in this class or if it was an online class. Um, and I don't mean the people that are in Zoom, I mean, the third part of this sequence, which is the actual pure online people. Like I never see them, y'all are, those people are never in Zoom with us or in the class. Um, but I think somebody commented, well, how do you know, like what to let you be and what to let DU be? And to be honest, there's no answer to that other than just practice, okay? 
you're not going to know right off the bat. And I couldn't even tell you how many times I myself have guessed the wrong thing, tried to do the problem. I got to a point where I couldn't go any further. So then I went back, did something else. And that's just how these problems are going to work, especially when we get to chapter eight and they start looking really crazy. You try, but if it doesn't work, it doesn't lead you nowhere, you try something else, okay? That's just how it's going to work eventually what happens is, is as you keep trying different things for different problems, you eventually start seeing patterns and start noticing certain things. And so then there you get a little bit better at figuring out what is you and what is DU. Like this problem, for instance, I already know what to let you equal because I am very familiar with my trig derivatives. So I know that the derivative of tangent is secant squared. And don't I have tangent with some power and then a secant squared sitting there? So that to me is why I know that. But that's just, again, for some experience, okay? If you would have tried to let u equal secant, then you would have gotten a derivative of what? Secant tangent. And then you have tangents, but you don't have any extra secants, okay? Or you have too many tangents and not enough secants. So again, it just comes with experience. There's no way to know you just try. <laughs> and then if it works and it gets you to an answer, yay. And some of the problems eventually will be able to be done in multiple ways. So for this one, I would let u equal tangent of x because I know that du is secant squared x. And then I think someone else specifically asked why, where are the DUs coming from? The DUs are coming from taking the derivative of this equation. So the derivative of U is DU and the derivative of tangent is secant squared DX. It's actually one DU, isn't it? The derivative of U is one, but I'm taking the derivative with respect to U. Over here, the derivative of tangent is secant squared, but I'm taking the derivative with respect to x, right? So then we just basically find the pieces and plug stuff in. So I see all of that already there, don't I? So all of that is going to become just du. I don't need to write the one. And then you have tan raised to the fifth power. So that's going to be u raised to the fifth power. When we integrate, it's u to the six over six, and we don't have bounds, so we do have to put our plus c. But this is not the answer, right? They didn't give me the problem with using it, did they? No. So we have to do like back substitution. So then that's actually 10x because u is 10x to the six power over six. And you can leave it like that or you can write it without the parentheses. Either way, both of them are correct. Now, just to explain, cause I say things sometimes, but not everyone understands math verbally. I know myself personally, I struggle with that as well. So if you say something to me, and I don't, it's different when students say stuff, because a lot of times students say, don't say the correct vocabulary. And so of course I'm not gonna understand what they're trying to say. But if somebody was speaking the correct vocabulary to me, I still would take a while to register what they're saying. But when I was saying up here, if I were to let u equal secant x, then du, would be secant x, tan x, because that's the derivative of secant, okay? Now, I do have the two secants, don't I? Because there's two of them there, right? And I do have an extra tangent, but the problem is, is that I'd have four extra tangents. And that's why I couldn't use this as my substitution. Not everyone would get spoken for, okay? Whereas when we did this, everyone did get spoken for, okay? Okay. 
Now we had a problem with the radical and multiplication earlier. The issue with this one is that you only have one term here and then this radical. And you cannot distribute this one term inside of a radical because this is not itself any radical. Side. Right, this is all inside and then this is just on the side, right? So you cannot just multiply those together. They're already pretty much multiplied together. I mean, if you really wanted, you could write it like this, but it's still not changing anything. Okay, so I can't do it like I did the last one where I just convert the exponent into a, a, a power and then just all already I can integrate it. You do need to use u substitution. So if I let u equal the inside of this cube, right? And that's the trick. If you see insides, that's usually your u. Whether it's inside a house, in, you know, at the bottom of a fraction, anything like that. But then what would the derivative be? What's the derivative of four? Four x plus c. Mm -mm, not the integral, the derivative. Nothing. Mm -hmm, nothing. And then what's the derivative of negative 2x squared? Nope, you're integrating again. Mm -mm. It's not 3x. It's no, no. threes. Okay. <laughs> It's a negative 4x. Remember, I'm asking you to derive, not integrate. Well, that's because you add it to the, you add the exponent to the, the front number. I multiplied. That's my constant. And then the derivative of x squared is 2x, right? So that's how I got negative 4x. Remember, for derivatives, you're taking away from the exponent, right? You're bringing down the exponent and then taking it away. You're integrating, you're adding the exponent and then dividing by the new exponent. So you do have to remember which one you're doing, whether you're deriving or integrating. And here I'm taking the derivative, okay? But that one was just zero, so I didn't write it. But that happens to match exactly what was it right here, right? And they kind of had them grouped like this for a reason. So if I hadn't rewritten it, you would identify that as the du right away, okay? So then if all of this is my u, I basically have the cube root of u and all of this is du. Then I'm actually going to rewrite this so that I can integrate it because there's no rule with a house in my uh, in my integral rules, but there is a rule for exponents. I'm using this one again. So there's no exponent in here, which means it's automatically a one. So my numerator is one. And then the index, right, is what goes in the denominator, which is three. What happens to negative four x that is outside the root? All of this became du. Ah. So all of that is du. And then everything inside the house is u. Mm -hmm. So when I integrate, I'm gonna get add one to the exponent, which is four thirds, multiply by that reciprocal. And since there were no bounds, I will put plus C. But of course I do have the back sub. And so U was this whole expression over here. So when I write this, I do have to write that whole expression where the U was.
Now remember, when you're integrating, what is integrating? Mm -hmm. What was another word for integral that they used at the very, very, very beginning in 5.1? You guys have used it in the class too. Not area, even before that section. It does start with an A though. You added? Not adding. Antiderivative? There you go, that's it. <laughs> You're finding the quote unquote anti, right? Derivative, which means if you want to check your answers, what do you do? Uh, mm -hmm. Find the derivative. So this is the answer. I'm done. Okay. But some people were very curious as to whether or not they did it right. And you can check, but unfortunately, it requires you to be really good at taking derivatives too, doesn't it? Okay. Which we should be at this point, but it'll be practice, I guess, if you keep trying to check your answers. So if I check, I basically have to take the derivative with respect to x of this expression. So when you take the derivative of this expression, your coefficient stays there, and then you bring down your power, so 4 thirds. You keep the base exactly the same as it was, and you decrease the power by 1, which turns it into 1 third. But chain rule says is if your base was not just x all by itself, you do have to take the derivative of that base. And the derivative of this is 0. And then the derivative of this is 4x. And what's the derivative of any constant? 0. So these wipe each other out at 4 minus 2x squared to the 1 third. And this is just negative 4x, and that's it. And what is another way of writing that if you're looking at this rule here? Cube root. Mm, cube root of all of this stuff to the one power, right? Isn't this the exact same expression that we have in there, right, at the beginning? So it does check out, OK? But if you didn't remember chain rule, you probably wouldn't have done the derivative right. And then you would have been like, oh, my answer's wrong. So that's why I say when you check it, it only works if you're really good at deriving, OK? I don't usually check my answers, honestly. I just hope that I did everything right. Because <laughs> it takes too much time sometimes, OK? I don't remember chain rule chicken chat because you know. Yeah, it, it's more complicated than that, but <laughs> for this problem, it's very easy. But chain rule is basically the same thing, is if you're not taking, if your base of the exponent is not just x, you have to apply chain rule. If your argument in a log or if your argument in a trig function is not just x, you have to do chain rule. Or if you have a denominator and your denominator is just x, you have to do chain rule. Chain rule applies in all of those. Okay, any questions about this one? There's the whole thing. I got a couple more. So we have this expression. Now we're starting to get into the problems where we have to actually manipulate our du in order to use it, okay? So here, what sticks out as a quote unquote inside? Function? What looks like it's literally inside something? Four negative three x squared. Mm -hmm. So that's what my eyes would go to. And so that's what I would start with. And then if it works, it works. And if it doesn't, then I'll go figure something else out. Eventually, we're going to get to problems where we're probably going to do them wrong a couple of times before we get them right. But I need you to see what the wrong path looks like so you know if you're going in the wrong path on the test. Okay. So if I try and take the derivative of this, 
the derivative of u is just going to be one with the du attached. The derivative of four is zero. And the derivative of negative three x squared is what? Negative six x to the one power. And then we'll tag on a dx. Now here's the issue. I do have x and a dx, don't I? So I've got this part, but what I don't have is a negative six in there. Now there are multiple ways that I have seen people deal with this issue, okay? One of the ways that I've seen people deal with the issue is to take a negative six over negative six and multiply it by the integral. Because it's like you're multiplying by one, right? You're really changing the value of anything, okay? But then what they do is they stick this negative six on the inside so that it can go away with the u or du in this. And then they're still left with this negative one six on the outside, okay? So that's one of the options to do. In the end, you end up with a one over negative six on the outside, right? The other option, which is the one I prefer to do, is to take this expression, and if that's all I want to replace, well, then I'm going to get that alone. And so then all I have is x dx, and then look what's in here. 1 over 6 u, isn't it? So the over 6 factor will still get played in regardless, okay? So I don't use this technique, but I want you to know that some of you did learn that technique when you took Cal 1. And if you did, this is totally okay. I know how to read it. I know how to apply it. I know how it works. So if you're doing this on your test, it's fine. Okay, I don't want you to think you have to do it my way. I'm not one of those people who like, you have to do it the way I do it or <laughs> it's wrong. And that's not the way I am. If you do it some other way and that way always works for you, then great, you could do that too. I said, there's lots of techniques, lots, lots. Okay, so now I know what I'm gonna replace x d with. It's gonna become this instead, right? And I also know what I'm gonna replace u with or what's gonna get replaced with u, right? This whole thing is gonna become a u. So this whole thing is gonna become a u. So this, ex this integral will become Mm, I'm going to separate this fraction actually first. I'm going to write it like this so that you can see what I'm doing. You see it there? If I were to multiply those two together, don't I get that original fraction? Right? It'd be top times top, bottom times bottom. Yeah, it's going to be. Everyone. Right. And so top times top would give me the X. And then this imaginary one times this would give me the same thing. Right. So that's just called splitting the fraction. Okay. It's just convenient so that I can visually see where all the pieces go. Okay. So then now what I'm going to do is this green stuff is going to become U. And then this stuff is going to become negative one six DU. And then I can take this one six out to the front. And here I'm gonna write u to the negative three so that I can use the power rule. Notice I have that one six in the front, don't I? Just like I would have if I'd have done it the other way. So if I apply the power, be very careful here. You add one to the exponent and divide by the new exponent. But if I add one to negative three, what's the new exponent? Negative two. Yes. So then divide by negative two. And then again, no bounds. So I must put plus C. Now I'm gonna simplify this. I'm gonna do two steps in one. Let me know if you follow or if you don't follow. But that's what we have. Right, negative times a negative is gonna give me a positive fraction. 
the denominators multiplied together give me 12. Negative exponent on the top means that that should actually go at the bottom, right? And then because I moved it, it's no longer negative. Kind of like the opposite step of this, right? It was at the bottom, we moved it up and made it negative. Now it's at the top negative, so I'm moving it back to the bottom. A negative exponent only moves your position from over or under the fraction bar. Am I done? Can I box this? No. Why? Because it's just formula x. Yep. So what was u? Mm -hmm. And then all of that's got to get squared. Let's see. Okay, this one's really weird. I don't know if I had one of these in the video, but I saw one of these somewhere in the assignment. And so I picked it. <laughs> so does anybody recognize anything? Like, what would be the first step you would do on this problem? Form T over U. You would say to do this? Or are you saying to do this? Uh, the second one. The second one? Okay, that is correct. And if I did that, what would be du? What would we get there if we take the derivative? What's the derivative of 4x? Four. Mm -hmm. What's the derivative of constant? Zero. So it's just 4, and then we tag on the dx. Now, do I have a 4? Just a regular four, not in the exponent. Is there a regular four in my original? No. So then I'm going to have to get rid of this four so that this is one fourth times du equal to just dx. And I do have just the dx, right? So, okay, u is going to become this. So this part is going to become u. And I wish I had a better color than green because green looks a lot like my blue, but I don't. Um, and then this is gonna replace dx. So this stuff is gonna now become that. So we have e to the u, right? And then dx is one for du. Now I can kick out my one fourth. Just a constant multiplier, right? But anybody recognize anything else? What would I do from here? The LN of E is one. What about ln of e to the u power? What is that? So, just to do it like another ln to bring uh, I know, but you're in the right track. Yes, <laughs> you're getting close. <laughs> there is a log property. There's a log property that says if you have uh, like this, whatever your argument is, you can bring that exponent to the front. Right? So if I were to do that here, that u exponent would come to the front, 
and I just have ln of e. And you're right, the ln of e is just one. So then what am I really integrating here? Just u. I was hoping somebody recognized it up there just so I could like get rid of that. <laughs> but it don't matter as long as you realize it somewhere, it still works out, right? So then this will be u squared over two, no bounds. So I'm gonna put my plus c. And then this is gonna be one a. And what is it that's actually being squared here? Or x minus seven. Mm -hmm. U was this guy, right? So that u right there is going to become four x minus seven. Good. Oh yeah, 5.6. I was like, why are limits in here? But I forgot what 5.6 was about for a split second. So that's the only thing I have for 5.5, okay? If you do come across problems when you're working on your assignment in 5.5 that you just cannot get around, um, please, please, please message me, okay? And when I say message me, I mean like to use the text messaging or the remind app messaging okay because those go straight to my cell phone so even if i'm busy or if i'm even just browsing the internet on my own phone i will see the message right it's going to pop up um i don't know if it was this class or another class i cannot remember That's what happens when you have seven classes um but i remember on friday somebody messaged me after 5 p.m I don't check my email over the weekend. I just don't do that. I might work on the Canvas app on my phone or, you know, of course I see the remind messages on my phone and I can work at it that way. And I, a web assign is just on the internet for me or in Canvas for you guys, right? So I could just go in there all on my phone. <laughs> so if you guys ask me questions in text, I can answer them really fast versus if you're emailing me in, especially in the weekend, if you're emailing me in ACES or Canvas, I most likely will not see that until I come back on Monday, okay? For this week, because we have Monday was a holiday, it didn't happen until Tuesday. And you don't wanna wait that long for an answer, right? So <laughs> especially not if an assignment's coming up due, you don't wanna wait that long. So be sure, be sure to text me, okay? And you can just take a picture of whatever it is you're doing on your computer, and then take a picture of your paper, whatever you've been trying so far, and I can tell you where, where to edit it, okay? So for 5.6, it was the big idea was the L'Hopital's rule, right? So if this was an indiscriminate form or indeterminate form, not indiscriminate, indeterminate form, which was these forms, I think it was like infinity over, inf there's a whole bunch of different, they're not equal. But there was a whole bunch of them. So if you had like infinity, zero, zero over infinity, actually that one doesn't matter, it's just zero. Um, oh no, it does matter because it's going. Um, if you get any of these kinds of, and you the same go for negative infinity, okay? So it might not necessarily just be positive infinity, it might also be negative infinity. And so that's essentially what's going to happen here is if I try to take the limit as x goes to four, this would be zero, and this would also be zero, giving me this indeterminate form. Okay, um, and so then I have to be able to figure out how to do this a little bit better. Now, what was L'Hopital's rule? Does anybody remember what L'Hopital's rule was? 
the derivative of the numerator over the derivative of the denominator? Mm-hmm. It said if you had a function like this, like you were taking the limit of a fraction, that you would get the same value if you took the limit of their derivatives. Oops. It's not two separate limits. It's just the same one limit. So it's not saying that this fraction is equal to that fraction. It's just saying that if you took the limit of this fraction and you took the limit of this new fraction, you would get the same answer. Okay. So since I do not have a determinant form, I cannot just plug in four right away and be done with it. Okay. I have this, this happens to me when I try to do it directly. So what we'll do is we'll apply L'Hopital's rule and do those derivatives. Now, this is actually what? 16 minus X squared to the one half. So I haven't applied L'Hopital's rule yet. I just rewrote my radical as an exponent. And now I'm gonna do L'Hopital's rule. Pretty easy one. What's the derivative of the denominator? Just one. One minus zero technically, right? But it's still one. Now the top, I'm glad we did that other problem because now we're getting some practice with the chain rule. So we bring on our power, keep the base the same, decrease the power by one. So now it's negative one half. And because the base is not just an X, I do have to apply chain rule. But the derivative of 16 is zero and the derivative of negative X squared is just negative two X. Now these two cancel, but I'll have an X in the numerator and because that's negative, now I have this in the denominator. Now, what is gonna happen as X goes to four? Oh, should be negative. Shouldn't it be negative? It will go to zero. Mm -hmm. So this bottom part will be going to zero. But if you have a fraction and the bottom is going to zero, what's happening to the whole fraction? As your denominator gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, the number itself gets what? The other way around. So if I have a numerator and a denominator and my denominator, or I'm sorry, is going to infinity, then that means the denominator is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So my fraction is getting smaller and smaller and smaller, right? So then the whole fraction will go to zero. But if my denominator is going to zero, that means that the denominator is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So just let me give you an example. If I have four over two, what is that? If I have four over one, what is that? If I have four over 0 0.5, you might not know what that is, but it's eight. So as my denominator is getting smaller, what is happening to the actual value? It's getting bigger and bigger. So when your denominator goes to zero, the whole fraction actually goes toward infinity. So if I were to plug in four, the numerator would be negative four, wouldn't it? But the denominator would be going to zero. So it doesn't really matter what's in that numerator. As long as it's a number up here, this whole thing is going to be going to infinity, but not positive infinity. Why? It's a negative four or a negative number. So it's actually going toward negative infinity. So 
But with these limit things, they're kind of weird because they require us to use a lot of logic. Like basically you have these two facts and then you got to like put it all together. Okay. So we know the, the L'Hopital's rule and then we know these two basic situations with fractions. I have a question. Sure. That's where you use the, like the numerator's first exponent is higher, lower, or equal to. Mm -hmm. You could do that here. Mm -hmm. Okay. But you always divide by the higher exponent though. So in here, which one, which exponent is higher? The, well, technically the numerator's exponent would have been higher. Just look at them for face value. Not, don't convert them to negatives. The, so this exponent is 10 and this one is 23, right? So what you would do is you would take the expression you could do it this way. This is what they show you to do when you're first learning it. But this is not, after you figure out L'Hopital's rule, we don't really do this, but it's not wrong. So you take each and every term and you divide it by that term with the highest exponent. And what happens is you end up with one over X to the 13th because you cancel 10 of them. You just get one. If I were going to infinity, that might help me, but this one's going to one, isn't it? So I can just direct substitute everything in there. And what will I get? I will get one over one minus one over one, one minus one over one. Oh, but don't I still have an indeterminate form? Won't I get zero over zero still? This technique usually works when you're going to infinity. Because if I was going to infinity, when the bottom's going to infinity, the whole thing goes to zero, doesn't it? So it'd be zero, 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 and zero over one would be zero. But it wasn't going to infinity. Okay, so that only works when it's going to infinity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But since ours is not going to infinity, what should we do? I'll do that one in red. So if I were to apply the L'Hopital's rule here, this would be 10x to nine. And what's the derivative of one? Mm -hmm, zero. And then what about the derivative of x to the 23rd? What is the is derivative? It 23rd x? Oh. Uh-huh. 23 x what? Um 22. 22. Mm -hmm. And then derivative of this one? Zero. Mm -hmm. And then could I cancel? I'm not supposed to cancel. Can I reduce any x's? This has got nine of them, right? And this one's got 22 of them. So imagine there was like X times X times X times X times X, nine of them. And same thing down here, but 22 of them. Couldn't you start striking some of them off, right? How many would I be able to strike off from both the top and the bottom? Nine. Nine. So I can cancel these nine with nine of these, but then that would leave me with 13. So I would have 10 to the 13th down there. But now if I try to plug in one, I don't have a problem. I don't get zero over zero if I try to plug in at this point. Because what is one to any power? Not the power. One, one times one times one times one, doesn't matter how many times I multiply it, 
it'll always be one. Mm -hmm. And so then the answer is just 10 over 23. So the last problem, did we determine that it's actually, the answer is negative four or is it negative infinity? Say it again for this one. Yeah, the last problem, um, did we, so the answer for the last problem was negative infinity? Yes, or, negative. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because this one's going to zero. It means that the fraction is getting smaller, but the numerator is negative. So all of those small numbers, or I'm sorry, all of these numbers are getting larger but they're getting larger in the negative direction because the numerator is negative. Okay, got it. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see. Oh, I got two of them. Okay, I got two of these. There were some like this in the video, but I don't think there was one exactly like this in the video. And I think I did get a question about this problem, something about how like one of these numbers got in the front. We'll do it right now so you'll see why it goes in the front, but the short answer is chain rule. Because this is actually the sign of that, right? And then the sign of this. Those are part of the angles or arguments, whatever you want to call them. So when I try to apply L'Hopital's rule, I do the derivative of this function. So the derivative of sine is negative cosine, but the angle should stay the same. And then chain rule says, if the angle is not just an X or just variable you're talking about, then you do have to apply chain rule. And the derivative of six X is six. And similarly, that's exactly what's gonna happen down here is the derivative of sine is negative cosine. You keep your angle the same, but if the angle itself is not just X, you multiply um, by its derivative. And a negative and negative is actually going to turn to positive, right? But I don't have the same problem as I had before because sine of zero is zero. And so if I would have tried to plug those in there, I would have got zero over zero, right? However, Cosine of zero is not zero. So this one will not give us an indeterminate form. So I can do direct substitution. What is cosine of zero? One. And so then I end up with six over five. So once I applied my L'Hopital's rule, I just did direct substitution to, plug, to find the limit, but six times zero is zero, and so is five times zero, right? And then cosine of zero is one, and it's the same at the bottom. And so we end with this. But yes, this happened because of chain rule. Eventually, I don't really even do that. If I'm going to be taking the derivative of sine of 6x, I know it's negative cosine, and I know chain rule is going to put that 6 multiplier in there. And so in the future, I might just go straight from here to here if I was taking the derivative, which I think is what I might have done in the video. And that's why people were wondering where that 6 came from.
Okay, I did see some of the comments, but I don't remember all of them. Is there anybody that has any questions? Whether you had them in the in the discussions um, or you thought of them afterward. But any questions or problems that you want to examine from 5.4, 5.5, 5 .5, or 5.6. So if you wrote anything down that you wanted to be sure to cover, let me know. If not, then those of you in Zoom, you can either stay in Zoom and work in WebAssign while you have the Zoom up, um, but I'm gonna pause the recording. And then those of us that are in class will work on WebAssign while we're in here, okay? But there's no more like lecture for today, okay? We got all three, all the examples. So I'm hoping that with the examples that you had videos for and with the examples that we've now covered in class, Together, you should be able to do most, if not all, of the problems in the homework sets um, or the web assign assignments. Um, but if there's anything else extra that, that you're just not seeing, let me know so we can cover it, okay? But I'm going to pause the recording. If someone brings up something that I want to mention to the class, I'll resume recording. But for the most part, we're just going to be working on web assign. I did forget all about this little guy. See what happens when I write things below? And then I just, I don't know where to decide to write it on the side. <laughs> but yes, let's do this. Thank you for bringing that up. Oh, I remember this one. This was not fun. I, yeah, right. <laughs> is that what happened? <laughs> So I'll apply L'Hopital's rule. And the reason why is because if I plug in infinity, if I raise infinity to the fourth power, it's a bigger infinity, isn't it? Is that X? Second? This is X over two. So here, if I plug in infinity, it doesn't even matter if I cut infinity in half, it's still infinity, okay? It's just a smaller infinity, but it's still infinity. And then E raised to the infinity is just another infinity, a really, really big infinity. And if I multiply it by five, it's still infinity. So this is infinity if I plug in infinity, and this is infinity if I plug in infinity, which is an indeterminate form, right? This over this means I need to apply L'Hopital's rule. So if I were to take the derivative of x to the fourth, what would we get? 4x to the third. third, yes, there you go. And then here, when you take the derivative of e, it's e to the same exponent, but if the exponent is just an x, you have to multiply by its derivative. What is the derivative of x over 2? Is it just one? Say it again. It's just one? It's not just one. The derivative of x is just one, right? But what is the ultimate derivative of x over two? Mm hmm one half. Now I've just applied the derivative rules just to recap, right? So again, I split the fraction. You can tear this apart, the numerator and the denominator, and get used to this technique because this technique is going to be used like a lot, a lot, a lot, like a lot, okay? So if you ever have fractions, you can always split them. You can write the numerator times where the denominator is, just put a one in the numerator now. Because if I were to multiply these, isn't it the exact same expression, right? So I haven't changed it. I just changed the way it looked. And then we know that when you're taking derivatives, this is just a constant multiplier. So you don't even take the derivative of a constant multiplier. It just resumes as a constant multiplier. So really, I'm only taking the derivative of just x, which was what? Huh. 
problem is, is even if I get rid of that double fraction down there and I multiply by the reciprocal, I'll have this. Doesn't that do the same darn thing as if I try to plug in infinity? When I cube infinity, it's still infinity. If I multiply it by eight, it's still infinity. So I have infinity in the numerator. If I plug in infinity here, half of infinity is still infinity. If I take my E and I raise it to the power infinity, it's still gonna be infinity. And then if I multiply that infinity by five, it's still infinity. So I still have the problem, don't I? Thank goodness they only gave me x to the fourth because I have to apply over and over and over and over again until I no longer have x in my numerator because that's the only way we're going to get anywhere, okay? So I have to keep doing this. And because I have a cube, I have to do it three more times, right? So we're going to go for it. So bring that down. It's going to make it 24x squared. 5e exponent stays the same, multiply by the derivative of x over 2. So I'm going to flip that up. It's going to become 48x squared over 5e to the x over 2. I don't know why I have an equal sign right there. It's not If I do it again, that's going to be 96x. And then the chain rule. So if I bring that up top, oh gosh, my brain's not working. 96 times two, what is that? 192. And last time, I get just 192 over 5 e to the x over 2 times 1 half. And that times 2 is 384. So I brought this two up again by multiplying and I got this. Now what happens? We get 384 over infinity, which goes to what? And it's not even equals. The limit of the numerator will be this and the limit of the denominator will be that. So what is the limit of that fraction? As the numerator goes to this constant, the denominator goes to infinity. So what is the whole fraction going to? Not infinity. Remember that four, as the denominator gets bigger and bigger, what's happening? It goes to zero. Mm -hmm. So if I'm, my denominator is getting smaller, my value is going to infinity. But if my denominator is getting bigger, then my value is getting smaller and it'll eventually go to zero. Now, personally, personally, I wouldn't even have done all of this. Because you'll notice in the directions of the test, I always say to explain your answer. Now, if that doesn't always mean you need to write algebra steps or calculus steps, okay? You could have said in words, once you realize this first one, you could have said, if I continually apply L'Hopital's rule, eventually I will end up with a constant in the numerator but I'll still have an expression with e to the x over two in the denominator. 
And then as the x goes to infinity, the numerator will remain that constant, but the denominator will be going to infinity, which makes the overall fraction value go to zero. And you don't have to repeatedly do L'Hopital's rule over and over again. You're just applying the logic of what will happen to make your conclusion. Okay. So it just depends on what you prefer, whether you'd rather write a little paragraph or you'd rather do all these stuff. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? <laughs> Did I look overlook anything else? Definitely make sure of that. And I have none on the back, right? Yeah. Okay. We still have about 20 minutes of class, so let me pause the recording. And again, if you're working on your web assign and you come up with questions, those of you in Zoom come off of mute and let me know. And then those of you that are in class, as you work on your web assign and you have a question, let me know. Because we might be able to address them to the class. Okay. But I'm going to pause and then I'm going to start walking around the room. Those in Zoom, you don't have to stay logged in if you want to work on Zoom. I mean, if you want to work on web assign and leave Zoom, that's okay too. But I will be here till 1150 and you can come back if you want to. <laughs> 